evening. My name is Carol Annett, and I'm a director on Sunnybrook's board, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's speaker series. Every April, we host a lecture on various aspects of cancer care. Tonight's lecture is focused on managing risk factors for cancer, and we're very excited to be able to deliver this to you. As we continue to navigate this challenging, exhausting, and constantly changing pandemic world we live in, it is especially important to remember that there are experts who can provide us with valuable information and resources that can guide us on our health journeys, COVID-19 related or otherwise. And although a lot of attention understandably remains focused on COVID these days, Having the opportunity to learn about cancer care and cancer risk reduction through lectures and education forms like the speaker series is critically important to help make informed choices about our overall health and well being. This evening, we are especially fortunate to have a panel of fabulous speakers presenting about cancer genetics, the role of nutrition and cancer risk reduction and the importance of cancer prevention and screening. We're very pleased to deliver our speaker series to you in our online format, and we sincerely hope you find tonight's discussion interesting and meaningful. Our public lecture forums are a great way for us to connect you, our patients and community members with relevant and timely health information. I'd like to now introduce you to tonight's moderator, Dr. Calvin Law. Dr. Law is the Chief of the Odette Cancer Program and Vice President for Regional Cancer Services here at Sunnybrook. He has been faculty staff since 2001 and as the co-founder of the Susan Leslie Multidisciplinary Neuroendocrine Tumors Clinic, Dr. Law takes an active part in the treatment of clinic patients. His research is focused on health services and population studies, especially in the delivery of care and outcomes in patients with surgically treatable cancer. Thank you so much for moderating tonight, Calvin, and I'm going to pass the mic over to you. Thank you so much, Carol, thank you. Good evening, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us virtually this evening. I have to start with saying we miss you. We always do this every spring. It's uh, one of our favorite things to do every year. We love and, and, and miss engaging with our community as we try to get through this unprecedented time. And I'd like to thank all of you for coming tonight. It means a lot to us, but also we're here because there's so much that our team would love to share with you. And tonight we have something which I think it's just a great thing to talk about after all of these years of uh, just a difficult, difficult time. And this is all about managing risk factors for cancer. For some of you who joined us for some of our previous um, meetings, it's been fantastic. We've done talks on how to treat things, on new technologies, but what can't be lost in your welfare and well being is managing your risk factors and doing that preventative work that can uh, be all uh, more effective than almost anything else that we did. So it's so lucky, as Carol mentioned, that tonight we have such a great lineup of speakers for you. I'm gonna give you an overview first, and as we get to each speaker, I'm gonna give you a bit more of an introduction to each. But we're gonna begin our evening with Tracy Graham, who's gonna tell you about cancer genetics. Then Rachel Reed will be presenting on the role of nutrition in cancer risk reduction. And finally, and certainly not least, Dr. Lisa Delgidice will wrap us up for the evening with a presentation on cancer prevention and screening. Now we've set some time aside at the end of the evening, as we've always had, uh, for you to ask uh, our panel speakers some of the questions that you might want. We used to write them on cards, we used to put up our hand, but there's, a, a way for you to put it in the chat room. Some questions have already been submitted and we're looking through them and we're gonna to try to get through as many as we can tonight 
Uh, if we don't get through all of them, we'll, we'll try hopefully to answer them in another format, but we'll try to get through as many of your questions tonight. So we're really looking forward uh, to uh, this evening. Um, to begin our event for tonight, I'd like to introduce you to our first speaker. Tracy Graham, uh, we've known each other forever, is one of our genetic counselors at the Odette Cancer Center uh, and, and a leader in our genetic counseling team. As a genetic counselor, Tracy consults with individuals who have a strong family history of cancer. She's able to conduct a risk assessment, arranges for genetic testing, and then most importantly, walks our patients through those really meaningful results. Tracy, thank you so much for spending some time with us tonight. And I'm gonna hand it over to you for all about cancer genetics. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction. Okay, I'm gonna share my stuff. Okay, I hope that's up okay. Can you see that okay? So I'm gonna be starting us off and I'm uh, obviously talking about cancer genetics and sort of a little introduction about what you need to know. Um, to start, just a little bit of an overview of what I'm gonna to cover tonight. Um, some background about really what is cancer and what is genetics. Um, some red flags for what we think about um, when it comes to looking at a hereditary cancer syndrome. Sorry, Tracy, we can't. Oh, I'm sharing the wrong screen. See, this is what happens. Okay, sorry about that. Okay, is that better? Excellent. Oh, so sorry. This is this is my thing. I am not the tech person. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much for jumping in on that. I apologize. Um, okay, so starting a, again with my overview, um, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, what cancer is and uh, the role that genetics plays in that. And just a few of sort of what I consider red flags for identifying a hereditary cancer syndrome. Um, a little bit about what a family tree looks like, what we call in genetics a pedigree, and then who is eligible for genetic testing and a little bit about the Genetic Non-Discrimination Act that's now here in Canada. Okay, so let's start with uh, some of the basics. What is cancer? So when we think about this, uh, I like to just show this picture and this is just showing a cell. Our bodies are made up of millions and millions of cells. All of our cells contain all of our genetic material and cells are constantly growing, they're replicating and they're dying. And so this is just a normal process. And so one cell will reproduce and create two copies of itself and everything that's within it uh, gets replicated. And this is a normal process that happens throughout our lifetime. Occasionally, you're gonna get a mistake. Cells aren't perfect. And sometimes when cells replicate, they make mistakes as well. And so sometimes that mistake can be fixed other times it cannot. And so sometimes you're gonna get these bad cells. I've got them there in green. And so they've replicated wrong. And then what can happen is they can continue to grow at a very fast rate, uncontrolled growth. And ultimately what this does is leads to a tumor or a cancer cell growing. So within our bodies, as I said, we're made up of millions of cells. All of our cells contain all of our genetic material. And that genetic material is made up of genes. And so we are made up of probably close to 20,000 genes in our body. And these genes basically derive every function and every part of who we are. And so there's genes for simple things like eye color and height. And there's genes for certain conditions like asthma or, you know, diabetes. And genes for different functions in our body, how we break down foods, how we do different things. And so all of our genes come in pairs. We get half of our genetic material from our mother and we get half from our father. If we have a change or a mistake on one of those genes, we call that a mutation. This is like thinking of a spelling mistake in a very big book. Um, and some mistakes can be okay and normal, but others, if it causes the, the wording or the function to not work properly, we call that a mutation. And sometimes on lab reports, you'll see that called a pathogenic variant. 
And so when we think about cancer genetics, uh, we think of how that gene gets passed down from one generation to the next. And so this example just shows uh, a pairing of a female and a male, and this is showing one example of a gene. And again, our genes come in pairs. So each person has two copies of that gene. In this situation, the father happens to have a mutation on one of his genes. And so when that couple has a child, the mother is going to contribute one copy or the other copy. So it's just a 50-50 chance of which copy of her gene she passes to each offspring. Likewise, the father does the same. And so for a lot of our cancer syndromes, when we think of cancer genetics, they're inherited in this dominant fashion. So it's a 50-50 chance of passing that same mutation to each child. And that's regardless of whether it's coming from the mother or the father. And that's regardless of whether it's going to a son or a daughter. It's a random event. We have no control over what genes we get from our mother and our father. And likewise, we have no control over what genes we pass to each of our children. So when we get into sort of the focus of hereditary, um, this is sort of what one of the focuses for us as a genetic counselor and what we would be looking at when we're talking to a family. How much cancer is hereditary? Many people are surprised to find out that it's actually quite a rare piece of the whole pie. Probably only five to 10% of all cancer, regardless of the type, is truly hereditary. And that means that it's, it's caused by a gene mutation that's being passed down from one parent to the next. So from parent to child, from one generation to the next. We also know that there's about 10 to 20% of cancer that we would call familial. And this is a cluster of cancer that we see, but it could be due to some shared genetic factors, but also because of some shared uh, environmental factors or lifestyle uh, factors that can play a role. So it can sometimes be tricky. We may look at a family tree and it might seem like there's a lot of cancer running in the family, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's hereditary. And then that leaves sporadic cancer, which is the majority. So 70 to 80% of cancer is still considered sporadic, which means it happens by chance. Um, and these often do happen uh, more typically at older ages of onset than we see in hereditary families. So hereditary cancer syndromes. There's a lot that I could talk about on this slide. Um, and I, I sort of picked a few of the sort of highlights and the main things that we would think about. Um, you know, when we look for hereditary cancer, probably one of the biggest things is uh, the age of onset. You know, it's breast cancer is common. You're going to see breast cancer happening. And for most of us, age is the biggest risk factor. And so as we get older, our chance of getting breast cancer in our lifetime is going to increase. And so if we do see breast cancers or colon cancers or other cancers at really young ages, so under 35 in particular, that's a little flag for us to say, could there be something in the gene that predisposed that person to develop that cancer at such a young age? And then we look at different types of pathology. So just the cells that make up that cancer, there's different kinds of cancers that we can define for certain syndromes. And so it, some of the examples are, are things like ovarian cancer. Not ovarian, all ovarian cancers are gonna be the same when it comes to a hereditary risk. Some ovarian cancer pathologies are strongly connected to genetic risk factors and some are not at all. And so that's sometimes important for us when we're looking at a family tree where we might have to dig a little deeper and actually collect pathology reports to review the exact type of cancer. And then I gave an example of medullary thyroid cancer. It's a very rare form of cancer, but has a very high hereditary risk as compared to follicular or papillary thyroid cancer, which are the very common cancers that we see for thyroid, yet don't often have a high hereditary risk with them. And then a diffuse gastric cancer. Again, another example of a very specific type of stomach cancer that would be a flag for us. And then it's a question of how many relatives in the family have certain cancers. Clearly, the more cancer we see in a family tree, the higher likelihood that there could be something hereditary. And so certain cancers can be sort of connected to one another. When we see breast, ovarian, and pancreas and prostate together, we might be more suspicious. Or if we saw colon, uterine, stomach, and ovarian together in a different family tree, again, we might be suspicious for something entirely different.
okay? And then this can also include the same person having multiple primary cancers. So if you have one individual who, who themselves over their lifetime has had two or three different kinds of cancers that we know may be connected, that's a flag to us as well because it's saying, why is that person not just getting one cancer, but two or possibly three cancers in their lifetime? Maybe there is an underlying gene mutation that again is putting them at a high risk. And then I just put out there male breast cancer. It's a very rare cancer, but on its own for us, that's a flag and anyone with a male breast cancer would be offered genetic testing. We sometimes look at ethnicity. And so I used the example of being of Ashkenazi Jewish background, which is Jewish of Eastern European descent. We know that families of Ashkenazi Jewish background with a strong family history of cancer can be at risk for carrying certain gene mutations. And sometimes we may target that testing accordingly. And then finally, we've started to learn over the last few years that different markers within cancer cells can be representative of higher hereditary risk. And so the classic example that's changed in the last few years is women with breast cancer when we call it a triple negative breast cancer. So those hormone receptors, estrogen receptor, progesterone, and the HER2 new, all being negative or absent from the tumor are suggestive of certain gene mutations. Okay, so a family tree, what we call a pedigree. So anyone that gets referred for a genetic counseling appointment, one of the first things we're gonna do is collect your family tree uh, information to really give us a, th a three generation glimpse of what your family history looks like. For us in genetics, this is probably the most important tool we have to work with because it really does give us a snapshot of your entire family tree on one page. And so I'm not gonna go into this in great detail, but you can see on the screen in the sort of bottom middle is the proband. The proband with the arrow is the person that we are seeing for genetic counseling. Some people get referred to us that have never had cancer themselves but have a very strong family history and others have had cancer themselves with or without a family history. And so we do see both types of families um, and have a, a discussion based on what that risk might look like. And so on a pedigree women are circles, men are squares and we connect you by relations. Your children, nieces, nephews below, your siblings or your brothers and sisters beside you, your mom and dad above, and grandparents above that, etc. And then we shade in any relative with cancer in black. Again, that's a flag for us to really see what we're dealing with. And if there's a line through them, it means they've passed away. And so as just one quick example of what a sort of high risk breast cancer pedigree might look like for us, this is just an example of a 40 year old female who is unaffected herself, but through her paternal or her father's side, there's a lot going on. She's got an aunt with an ovarian cancer, an aunt who had two separate breast cancers and passed away, an uncle with breast cancer whose daughter had breast cancer at a young age. These are all hallmark features of a high hereditary risk looking family. And so this family would probably be offered some genetic testing to hopefully identify a gene mutation that can then be tracked in other relatives for proper screening and preventive recommendations. So who is eligible for genetic testing? Because I get this question a lot. Um, people are going to wonder if they're, you know, if they're eligible or who is eligible. And there really is a little bit of thought that goes into this. Um, the bottom line is we do have sort of criteria for whether the, the patient seeing us has had cancer versus whether they do not and they're unaffected. Generally speaking, I can say it's always going to be best for us to test the most appropriate relative with the most appropriate cancer. And so if you have a family history of, you know, lots of breast cancers and everybody's available for testing, I'm usually going to pick the youngest case in the family. I want to target the person most likely to have that gene mutation, because if I can find that in her, then I know what to open up and offer testing to everybody else. Obviously, not every family is created uh, the same. Every pedigree is unique. Every pedigree is different. And every family situation is different. And so we certainly do navigate through through how best to approach that um, in every family. We do have a very standardized uh, Ministry of Health provincial criteria. This is uh, OHIP funded when you meet criteria. So obviously we, we can't test everybody. This is the, the, you know, a reality is that hereditary cancer is only five to 10% of all cancers. And so we don't need to be testing everybody. We need to focus on those families that meet a certain threshold or high likelihood of carrying uh, a gene mutation. 
And then for those without, often when we do testing, it's either because, first of all, a mutation has already been identified in another relative. And so this is familial or predictive testing for a known mutation. Again, we touch on the Ashkenazi Jewish component because we know that certain mutations are very common in that group that we do have a small panel that we can sometimes offer based on that history. And then we have, you know, models and clinical judgment. Clearly, there is some room for those families where, you know, the relatives may not be available for testing. They live in different countries. We can't always access testing everywhere in the world. And so we realize sometimes there have to be concessions made that it may not be the best person to test, but it's the most appropriate based on what we've got in front of us. And so genetic testing is done usually through blood. Um, things are changing during COVID. We do have some testing that's being done through saliva kits as well, um, but the standard is still mostly blood. Um, it is what the, the labs prefer to use. It's what most of the labs are validated for extracting that genetic material or the code, what we call DNA. Um, and so that is what's often used throughout most of our Ontario labs. And most results don't come back immediately. They do take some time. Uh, and this is also sometimes uh, interesting to pe for people to hear that, you know, genetic testing does take usually a good couple of months. We sort of say eight to 12 weeks, but usually probably around eight weeks, about two months for results. Um, we do have that option when needed to expedite or make it uh, sort of a, a quicker turnaround time. If it's an urgent case, newly diagnosed, maybe some surgical planning happening, then clearly we want to get that result out much quicker. Um, the testing itself, most of our testing these days, I'm going to say, is what we call panel genetic testing. Panel just means testing for multiple genes. Um, we've come a long way in genetics, and I'm going to touch on this at the near the end of my presentation. Um, you know, I've been doing this for over 20 years, and over the last five years alone, the, the changes in genetics have been exponential. And so the number of genes that we have available to test for has really, really gone up. Um, and then there's the BRCA Ashkenazi Jewish panel, which just focuses on three very common mutations that we see in the BRCA1 and the BRCA2 genes. Uh, BRCA1 and 2 are the probably two most common hereditary uh, breast ovarian cancer genes that we know about. And then predictive is when there's a known mutation in the family, and we're just going to target and focus on that. When it comes to test results, Genetics is never black and white. It is definitely a, a bit of a, an evolving curve and it's a gray zone. Um, we usually tell people we're gonna get one of three results, a positive, a negative, and an uncertain. So a positive is when we identify a mutation. So again, we're looking for either a known mutation or we're starting from scratch and we don't know what we're looking for and we often go in with a panel and we're gonna try to find that mutation. We identify it in the person and this, may give us information because it might be the reason and explain why the cancer is happening in the family. It may provide us with additional information on how we can now better follow that person who's had cancer because maybe he or she is at risk for additional cancers and we may need to screen differently. And then obviously now we can offer and open up that testing to other family members who are interested in knowing if they're at risk. So this is probably the biggest game change when it comes to a positive result is that now that opens up testing to everyone else in the family. A negative result is, is exactly what it sounds like. Nothing is found. So you look at these, uh, these genes and we see nothing. All the code looks normal. The sequences look um, no, no changes. And so the question is, okay, is this because it's not hereditary? Often that's the case. You know, when we do testing, we know um, that probably nine times out of 10, a result is going to come back negative. If I put 10 women in the room with the exact same high risk looking family, the same cancer, the same ages, probably one of them has a mutation in a gene and nine of them don't. I, have to, of course, have to test all 10 to figure out which one has it, but most of the time results are going to be negative. That is, of course, still reassuring. It's helpful for us to know that we've reduced hereditary risk as much as possible. It is possible that maybe that person wasn't the right person to test. Maybe that was the wrong person and maybe there's still hereditary cancer in the family and we need to dig deeper and test other relatives to see if there still could be a gene going on in the family. 
And maybe we've tested the wrong gene. We're made up of 20,000 genes and our panels, you know, they're getting there and we're testing for lots of genes, but we're clearly not testing for everything. And there could still be other genetic factors that we don't know about yet. And then of course, a predictive negative. So there's a known mutation in the family and someone comes in and has testing for that mutation and they're negative. That's great news. That means that they're probably closer back to general population risk because they did not inherit the risk that's present in the family from a hereditary perspective. And then uncertain, this is the gray zone, uncertain results. We call them variants of uncertain significance or a VUS. This is really common in genetics. Our labs are looking at genes that can be thousands of, of base pairs in length. And all it takes is one little change in that code. And for many of us, we all are born with, uh, with changes in our DNA. We all have mutations. And we also all have a whole bunch of silent benign changes in our DNA that cause us no harm at all. And when I use an example, when I'm talking to patients, I kind of use the, the word color as an example. So so whether you live in the United States or Canada, in the States, they spell it C-O-L-O-R. You come to Canada, we spell it C-O-L-O-U-R. So the code is different, but there's no loss of meaning. Everybody knows what the word color means. And so those silent changes are not harmful at all. The challenge is sometimes our labs can't tell whether these changes are silent ones or could they be a true mutation. And so when they're not sure, they often label them with as these VUSs. And we basically allow science uh, to figure figure out over time what they possibly mean. And so sometimes it's really important for these families to keep in touch with us on a semi-regular basis so that we can constantly go back and relook at the literature. So this is a busy slide and, and I, my point to this is not for you to be able to read all the syndromes and to read all the genes. For this, I really just wanted to show you where we've come in the last 20 years. I've circled in red a couple of things, BRCA1 and BRCA2. So many of you will have heard of these genes. They're sometimes called the BRCA genes. Uh, BR stands for breast, CA stands for cancer. And this is what they were labeled back in 1994 and 1995. And so for the longest time, they were our only two breast cancer genes. And even back, I think of back when I started in the 90s and into 2000s, you know, the, the amount of or the level of ability to look at those genes was so limited and has changed so much since then. And then in the middle, I've got the Lynch syndrome panel circled. And Lynch syndrome is our main hereditary GI colon cancer syndrome, uh, named after Dr. Henry Lynch. And uh, we see colon cancer, uterine cancer in these families. And again, those genes came along shortly after the BRCA genes. And for probably 10 to 15 years, this was genetics and this was all we had available. And now I look at these panels today and I say, this is what we're looking at in 2021. And it's pretty remarkable how much things have changed. And this has pretty much been over an evol evolution over the last five years. And I flagged this because really panels in Ontario have just really revamped even as of April of this year. So this is really timely. It's sort of just changing. And we are now able to offer panels for not just hereditary breast, ovary, prostate, or Lynch, or the colon cancer, like I said before, before, but we've got a gastric or stomach panel now. We have a pancreatic cancer panel. We have a melanoma, a renal or kidney panel. There's so many different options. And I couldn't even begin in a 15 minute talk to get into the ins and outs and the nuances of who should be referred for what different uh, syndrome. But certainly if there's ever any doubt, obviously speak to your family doctor about a referral because a lot has, has definitely changed. And I think my other take home on this is that we have so many families in our system that probably had some level of genetic testing that was done 5, 10, 15, 20 years ago that probably should consider coming back for some updated assessment because it's very possible that the BRCA testing or the Lynch syndrome testing that we offered uh, back then has evolved and changed. And it's possible that it might be time to have a relook at some of these families. And so I wanted to touch on the genetic non-discrimination non actor, GNA. And I think this is important because this is relatively new in our world. Um, it, it's a law that's been passed uh, through, through the Canadian government. And it, it was sort of enacted in May of, of 2017. And it's uh, held strong since then. And it's been really important because ultimately it's there to prevent insurance companies from discriminating based on a genetic test result. Um, they can't tell you to get genetic testing. They can't 
ask for your genetic test results. Uh, this is new and this is a new protection. Of course, it does not protect from all the usual stuff about personal and family history of cancer. So like before, insurance companies, when they you know work you up, are still going to ask if you've had cancer. They can still ask if you have a family history of cancer. Um, and that's no different than before. It's just that they can't take it that next step to ask about any genetic testing. And so finally, I just wanted to end on uh, this slide, which is just a little link to our website in case you have uh, questions or if you want more information, um, you can go to sunnybrook.ca slash cancer genetics. Um, our referral form is there. So if anyone uh, was ever interested in a referral, you certainly could get that downloaded to give to your family doctor. Um, our contact information is there, including our Sunnybrook email address. And then I've just circled on the left a link to our videos because we do have brand new videos videos, uh, patient friendly videos that we've uh, put together. Uh, one is a little bit of summary of some of the stuff I've talked about tonight about cancer and genetics. And one is more focused on uh, women and breast cancer risk and sort of some risk models we use to calculate lifetime risk to develop breast cancer uh, over one's lifetime. So anyway, I just want to leave it there. And thank you very much for your time and attention. And I think that's it. Well, thanks, Tracy. Uh, it's so, uh, we're all so lucky to have you and our genetics team take us through such complex things. I know how often you take a patient through a complex thing, but actually boil it down to the most important things that they need to know. So thank you uh, so much for giving us a, a really a better understanding and everything. And that GNA at the end is also so important. So many people at the end say, but then what? And uh, thank you for that. My pleasure. So I'd love to introduce our next speaker, Rachel Reed. Rachel is a clinical dietitian at the Odette Cancer Center and part of our clinical nutrition staff. Rachel is also close to me because of how many times she's helped patients of mine. As a GI uh, surgeon, I guess uh, in some weird kind of way, my job is to mess up people's digestive system. And I can't thank Rachel enough for the time she's come to the rescue. So Rachel, on that end, um, uh, you know, to have you here tonight to talk about nutrition and, and, the, and the effects on cancer is so valuable. So thank you for being here with us tonight, Rachel. Thank you for the introduction, Dr. Law. I'm just going to share my screen now. Okay, hopefully everyone can see my slides okay. Um, today, I'm here to talk about the role of nutrition in cancer risk reduction. And so to do that, we're going to go over a few things. First of all, I'm going to start with how lifestyle factors relate to cancer risk reduction. Um, and then we're going to go into some, some guidelines. So all of these guidelines will come from the American Institute for Cancer Research. And they have 10 lifestyle guidelines, and we're going to go through the nutrition-related ones. So to start, um, you may be wondering how lifestyle factors relate to cancer risk reduction. And so what we know from research is that up to one in two cancer cases are estimated to be preventable through adopting healthy lifestyles and avoiding exposure to occupational carcinogens, environmental pollution, and certain long-term infections. So the last three, we don't have a lot of control over. But what do we mean when we say adopting healthy lifestyles? It really comes down to four things. So number one, avoiding tobacco. Number two, appropriate diet. Number three, getting enough physical activity. And number four, maintaining a healthy body weight. And so today, hopefully I'm going to give you an idea of what an appropriate diet looks like for cancer risk reduction. However, before we get into that, um, whenever we're talking about lifestyle factors, it's important to acknowledge what we call the causes of the causes of disease. So it's important to note that um, lifestyle factors aren't always just about the individual. There are much larger influences at play. And what I mean by that is that although we know our day-to-day -day choices are influenced by knowledge, attitudes, and beliefs, Unfortunately, our knowledge, our attitudes, and our beliefs tend to be poor predictors of behavior overall. What's actually a better predictor of behavior is our social norms and our environment. 
And so although we're going to be talking about what, what things we can do as an individual to reduce our risk of cancer, it's important to acknowledge that there are larger things at play. So, so what do our societies look like? Um, what are our government policies? How are our communities set up? And a, a really easy way to illustrate this is, is the effect that our environment has on physical activity. So we know that people who live near trails are actually 50% more likely to meet physical activity guidelines. And the same goes for nutrition. So you may know, for example, that eating an apple every day is good for your health, but if your environment doesn't make it easy for you to eat an apple every day, you're much less likely to do so. But let's get into these guidelines. So the American Institute for Cancer Research is a great organization from the United States. And what they do is they look at all of the nutrition, um, physical activity and diet research all across the world they look for which studies are good studies and which studies are bad studies. And then they bring together all of the really good research and they present their 10 cancer prevention recommendations. So you can see they're, they're all here and we're gonna go over the ones that are mostly nutrition related this evening. So to start, um, their first guideline is to eat a diet that's rich in whole grains, fruits, vegetables, and legumes. And underneath this goal, um, or underneath this guideline, they have three goals. So number one, we want to be aiming to eat at least 30 grams of fiber daily. Fiber comes from plant-based food, so it's part of the plant that doesn't digest it adds bulk to our stools and it has all sorts of good health benefits, including reducing our risk of cancer, especially colorectal cancer. Um, their next goal is going to help you achieve that 30 grams of fiber daily. So they say most of our meals should include whole grains, non-starchy vegetables, fruits, and pulses such as beans and lentils. And for our more numbers people out there, you really should be aiming to have at least 3.5 to 5 cups of a variety of non-starchy vegetables and fruits every day. So you may be saying, Rachel, why are you telling me this? We already know this. This is very straightforward stuff. But unfortunately, we know that most Canadians aren't achieving these recommendations. So most Canadians eat less than half of the daily recommended amount of fiber. So if we're aiming for 30 grams, most of us are eating 15 or less grams a day. Um, and even a little bit more concerning than that, only one in four Canadians consumes fruits or vegetables five or more times daily. So even though it's simple, we're having a hard time achieving these goals. And, and if we put our focus here, um, we could significantly um, improve our, our lifestyle factor. So I've got five foods that you can add into your day-to-day -day routine to help you achieve that 30 gram of fiber daily target. So my first food is chia seeds. In about an ounce of chia seeds, there's about 10 grams of fiber. They're very versatile. You can add them to your yogurt. You can add them to your cereal. You could add them to your smoothies. Um, you could even make some chia seed pudding. Try Googling that when this presentation is over. It makes a great dessert or snack. My second food to add into your day-to-day -day routine is raspberries or any berry, but raspberries happen to be my favorite. In about a cup of raspberries, you're gonna get about eight grams of fiber. And really important to note here that frozen and fresh are equal choices, especially at this time of year. Um, I personally would choose frozen because it's much more cost-effective and they're just as healthful as there are fresh option. Um, third choice, beans and legumes. So these are very heavy hitters when it comes to fiber. In about a cup of boiled lentils, you're getting about 16 grams of fiber daily. So just with that, you're more than half of what you need in terms of fiber every day. You can add them to soups, you can have them in, in stews, you could even replace some of the meat in some of your recipes with beans or legumes, they're very versatile. Last two foods, um, fourth is avocado. In about a cup of avocado, you've got about 10 grams of fiber. You can add it to toast, have it as a snack, add it as a side in your meal. And last but not least is bran buds. Um, these are my favorite things you can find in the cereal aisle. In about a third of a cup of bran buds, you're getting about 13 grams of fiber. So again, about a third of the way there in terms of getting up to that 30 gram of fiber daily mark. 
You can add them to yogurt, you can add them to salads, you could add them to cereal. Um, so if you took all five of these foods here and you added them into your day-to-day -day routine in these serving sizes, you'd be at about 57 grams of fiber already. So that 30 gram of fiber daily recommendation, it's not, it's not unachievable. It's just something that takes a little bit of thought and a little bit of planning. So their second recommendation is to limit consumption of fast foods and other processed foods that are high in fat, starches, or sugar. And so what I really like to, to talk about here is that processed foods are not inherently bad. There's, there's nothing really about them that's inherently harmful to your health, but what limiting processed products does is it helps you control your overall calorie intake and therefore it makes it easier for you to maintain a healthy body weight. The reason for this is, is that most fast foods and other processed foods are high in calories and quite low in other nutrients. Um, and so when we're eating diets that are very high in calories, we tend to have weight gain over time. And unfortunately, being at a higher body weight is related to increased risk of 12 different types of cancer. So it, so it is something to, to keep in back of mind. And here's just a little bit of research to illustrate this point. So the title of this study was Ultra Processed Diets Cause Excess Calorie Intake and Weight Gain. So what they did here is they took 20 adults and they put them in an inpatient unit. So they stayed in those units um, for the duration of the study and they monitored what they ate. So for 14 days, they gave each person an ultra processed diet and then they took a break. And then for another 14 days, they gave them an unprocessed diet. Both the diets were matched for calories, sugar, fat, fiber, and macronutrients. And then the adults were allowed to eat as much food as they wanted. So until they felt full and until they felt satiated, and what this study found is that when the adults were allowed to eat as much food as they wanted from each diet, um, the overall intake in the ultra processed diet was about 500 calories a day more than the unprocessed diet. So again, this is just illustrating that these foods are delicious, they're high in energy, and when we're left to our own devices, we tend to eat more of them. And this is just a real world example here. So here you've got two breakfast choices. We've got one from Tim. So one is a bacon breakfast sandwich and a medium double-double. Um, and then the other option is a more homemade option. So we've got a homemade Greek yogurt parfait with about a third of a cup of Greek yogurt, um, a cup of berries, and about a third of a cup of bran buds, and then a homemade coffee. So both of these choices are pretty similar in volume. And they're pretty similar in the amount of time they take to prepare. So you've got maybe five or 10 minutes to go through the drive through and maybe five or 10 minutes the night before work to throw together the, the homemade Greek yogurt parfait. What you can see here is that the, the more processed option has almost double the calories and it's got almost three times the amount of fat. It's a little bit higher in sugar. Uh, what's really important to note here is that they are very similar in protein. Protein is really important for keeping us full. So both of these options are gonna help keep us full for a long time. And, and really interesting here is that the process option only has about two grams of fiber, whereas the homemade option has about 17 grams of fiber. So the homemade option is gonna help you achieve that 30 grams of fiber day mark. So again, it's not that processed foods are inherently bad, but if we are consuming them frequently in our diet, they tend to, to lead to weight gain over time. Our third recommendation here is to limit the consumption of red and processed meat. So red meat is things like beef and pork and lamb. Um, and the recommendation here is to limit to 12 to 18 ounces of red meat a week. And you can see in this picture here, this is about a three ounce serving of meat. So about the size of a deck of cards or about the size of the palm of your hand is about three ounces. So for red meat, you could have about four to five three ounce servings a week and you would be well within these guidelines. Unfortunately for processed meat, um, the recommendation is much stronger. So their recommendation is to consume very little, if any at all, processed meat. So this includes things like ham, hot dogs, deli cuts, and sausages. 
Um, and this recommendation really relates to risk of colorectal cancer. So we know when people have high intake of red meat and high intake of processed meats, they are at a higher risk for developing colorectal cancer. Uh, but what I like to say here is remember, it's not always about what's included. It's also about what isn't included in the diet. So studies show, this is a quote from the American Institute for Cancer Research. Studies show that putting a lot of red meat on your plate often crowds out whole grains, vegetables, fruits, beans, and other plant-based foods that have been shown to reduce risk of cancer. So what I, what I ask you to do in your day-to-day -day life is think about meat more as a side dish, right? Oftentimes when I ask my husband, what are we having for dinner? He'll say chicken or he'll say fish or he'll say pork or he'll say beef. And, and we don't think of the vegetables as, as the main component. Um, so if you can think, think about what are you having vegetable and whole grain wise and have a smaller portion of meat. Another great option is to go meatless every now and then. Again, it doesn't need to be an all or nothing thing. Pick a night of the week when you choose a meatless option or, or pick a meal during the day, breakfast or lunch that you like to have um, meatless or plant-based. Um, at most of your meals, load up on the good stuff. So fill your plate with those fruits, the veg, the whole grain, and, and fill the rest of the plate with the meat last. And then of course, where you can skip the processed meat. Our next recommendation here is to limit consumption of sugar sweetened drinks. And, and the goal here is really just do not consume sugar sweetened beverages um, at all or, or limit them as much as you can. And the reason here is very similar to the processed food reasoning. Um, unfortunately, sugar sweetened beverages provide energy, but they don't reduce our appetite. So what happens when you're getting energy, but your appetite isn't being reduced is that over time, it's likely going to contribute to weight gain because eventually you're going to need to eat something that's gonna help you control your appetite. Um, so when you're drinking sugar sweetened beverages, you're really just drinking calories without getting any of the, the good benefits of, of a satiating meal or snack. Um, and whenever I get asked about sugar sweetened beverages, people ask me, what about fruit juice? Does, is it a sugar sweetened beverage? Should I have fruit juice? Um, and the re recommendation here is very similar. So do not consume fruit juices in large quantities as even with no added sugar, uh, they're likely to promote weight gain. And just to illustrate that point here, I've got a comparison between an apple and a cup of apple juice. So with the apple, you see it's less energy dense, less concentrated than the juice. But the big point here is that when you eat the apple, you're getting all of the fiber from the apple. So you're getting about 4.4 grams of fiber in one apple. Whereas if you drink a couple of apple juice, you're going to get no fiber. So it's really not going to help keep you full for very long. And then of, of course, because we we're concentrating the apple juice, it also has more sugar. So if given the option, I would prefer you choose whole fruit over fruit juice if you can. Alcohol, everyone's favorite subject. Um, the recommendation from the American Institute of Cancer Research is to limit consumption of alcohol. Um, for other types of disease guidelines, you'll see that it's recommended that women have no more than one standard drink a day and men have no more than two standard drinks a day. Unfortunately, when we're talking about cancer, even small amounts of alcoholic drinks can increase the risk of some cancers and there really is no level of consumption below which there is no increase in the risk of, of cancers. So particularly ones of the GI tract, we're talking about colorectal, esophageal, head and neck cancer, stomach and stomach cancer as well. The final point from the ARC that we're going to talk about today is do not use supplements for cancer prevention. So this is one of their recommendations and they say high dose dietary supplements are not recommended for cancer prevention and that we should be aiming to meet nutritional needs through diet alone. So this is a really important point because supplements, dietary supplements, herbal supplements are very prevalent in today's society. But what I ask people to keep in mind is that when you eat whole foods, your body absorbs a range of vitamins, minerals, amino acids, and other health compounds that work together to protect your health. 
But when vitamins, minerals, and fiber and other food substances are isolated into supplements, they may not be absorbed as well by our bodies as they are from whole foods. And also they may not be working together with all those other compounds in the whole foods to provide those good health benefits. And what we see with supplement companies is that when we look in the literature and we, we discover a food that may be beneficial to, to our health, the supplement companies like to isolate that compound and then sell it to people for an outrageous amount of money when really we should be encouraging people to just eat those good whole foods. Um, and to hit this point home even further, um, unfortunately, herbal supplements and nutritional supplements are often marketed as natural and benign and, and safe for our health. But, but this is a recent study from, I believe, 2018. And essentially what it showed is that herbal and dietary supplements now account for about 20% or one in five cases of liver damage in the United States. Um, and that the majority of cases of herbal and dietary supplement associated liver injury was due to multi-ingredient nutritional supplements. And so the component responsible for the toxicity um, often is unknown. We can't tell because there's so many ingredients in these supplements. So again, just another reason to try and meet your needs through diet as much as you can. Um, these supplements are, are not benign and there's really no reason to take a supplement unless it's indicated, unless you're deficient. Like in, in Canada, we really all should be taking vitamin D because we don't get enough from the sun, but otherwise get your nutrients from food as much as you can. So in summary, Nutrition is very complicated. When we look online or we look in Google or we look in the media, you'll see all this information on, on fad diets. And I, I ask you please to not get caught up in, in the hype and, and what people are trying to sell you. Nutrition really is quite straightforward and quite simple. The basics are really important. And if you follow the basics, I hope from this presentation, you understand that you are doing a lot to, to reduce your risk of, of cancer. So what we should be aiming for is to have half our plate be fruits and vegetables, a quarter of our plate be some sort of lean protein and a quarter of our plate be some sort of whole grain and make water your drink of choice as much as possible. And beyond that, also enjoy the foods that you eat because food is, is more than just health. It's also about enjoyment and, and maybe not at this time, but, but pre-COVID time, spending time with friends and, and family and enjoying the whole experience. Um, and thank you guys so much for listening. Wow, Rachel, thank you so much. I always learn something every time I hear from you and, and you take such a you know broad thing with so many you know every day in the media highlights and you turn it into something understandable but just to make you laugh at two o'clock in the morning in the hospital my only friend is the vending machine that now <laughs> allows you to tap with your phone and it drops a bag of chips your voice will be in my mind we have to make good choices even when it's hard so thank you thank you thank, thank you. you it's so important now, I just wanted to take some time out for the audience to remind uh, everyone and hope you're enjoying this as much as I am right now that uh, we are still conducting questions and answers so you can submit them on the chat or through sunnybrook.ca speaker series so you have lots of opportunities to uh, continue asking questions if you have like I said we'll continue to try and address all of them so at this point I'm going to pivot to our last speaker for the evening but certainly not our least my friend and, and, and certainly my partner in the leadership realms at Cancer Care Ontario, Dr. Lisa Delgirice. She's uh, our regional primary care lead uh, for Ontario Health, Cancer Care Ontario here in Toronto Central North and a family physician as well. We're so lucky to have her at the Sunnybrook Academic Family Health Team. Dr. Delgirice, thank you for being here tonight. Hi there, sorry. I'm gonna give this technology thing a try, so bear with me here and hopefully I can find, no, oh, I'm not finding it. Huh. Try again. Okay, it's not coming up. So I'm not finding my presentation. Um,
me try this. Oh. Sorry, I don't know if the audio visual people can help out, maybe. Not help, no. Uh, sorry, guys. Okay. I don't know where it's gone to. It's probably on the other screen. On the other screen. I took the other screen off because I was worried that that was making it worse. Um, uh oh, and it says PowerPoint is open, but for some reason, should have saved it to my screen. Um, let me try doing that. <laughs> Let's see if I can bring it up. Uh -oh. Oh. There it is. Can you guys see that? Nope. Good. All right. Okay. Now, how do I move forward? There we go. Okay. Sorry about that. I'm just going to go backwards here. Um, and I'm going to be speaking to you about cancer prevention and screening this evening. And so I'm going to dive into cancer prevention. And I didn't realize I didn't get to see Rachel's talk beforehand. So I'm sorry if I'm repeating some of the things that she's saying as well. But I wanted to talk a little bit about um, actually some Canadian information that came out about five years ago in 2015. There was this, a big study that was done to look at um, what are some of the lifestyle environmental infectious factors that may cause cancer. And it was called the Canadian Population Attributable Risk of Cancer, called a COMPARE study that was done across Canada to look at what are the most modifiable and preventable causes of cancer. And similar to what Rachel said earlier, um, they found that tobacco, physical activity, inactivity, excess of weight, low fruit intake, and sun exposure were the top five preventable causes of cancers among Canadians. And the numbers that are beside each of those um, factors are actually the number of cases in Canada that are likely due to that cause. And you can see that about 18% of cancers that are diagnosed of all cancers diagnosed are actually attributable to tobacco. So if you smoke, quit smoking, that's probably one of the best things you can do. The other key findings I just wanted to highlight because I won't go into because there was a lot of findings about that came from the study was that about four in 10 cancer cases can be prevented just through healthy living and policies that protect the health of Canadians. And the other thing that came up was cervical cancer is the most preventable cancer. It's about 100% preventable, largely due to HPV vaccination. So that's that Gardasil vaccine that some of your children and grandchildren might have gotten in school and also through screening as well, through cervical screening. One thing I wanted to point out was, was something called My Cancer IQ, and that's what the logo looks like. Um, and you're probably wondering, well, what is My Cancer IQ? Well, it was a website that was designed for the public to help them understand the risk of cancer and what they can do to help lower their risk. Uh, it was developed by Cancer Care Ontario, which is now Cancer Care Ontario, Ontario Health, uh, funded by the Ministry of Long-Term Health, um, health care and it, it what it does is and I'll take you through the next screen is that if you go to the home page you can see that there are six types of cancers here breast cervical colorectal kidney lung and melanoma and what you can do is you click on if you click on the icon and you want to find out what's my risk of developing breast cancer and what can I do to lower my risk or prevent it um, it it asks you a, it'll ask you a whole series of questions and at the very end it'll tell you this is what you should do to lower your risk or you should do to possibly even prevent that type of cancer and so it takes about five minutes to go through each cancer. But if you decide you want to do all six all at once, um, what, what it does is it, re, it remembers what you, you, what you answered in the last uh, cancer site. And so you don't have to keep answering the same question. So you can probably do this, all six of them, in less than half an hour if you were really interested. So I'm going to jump into cancer screening now because it's my um, area of interest, my biggest area of interest. And there's four, what we call organized cancer screening programs in Ontario. And what we mean by organized is that 
for people of a certain age group or a certain risk group, we invite each and every person who would be eligible for screening, and we're gonna go through that eligibility criteria in the next few slides for each of the, of the, the programs, that they're invited to participate through that invitation, they're also recalled back when it's time to be screened again. Um, so some of you guys might have received those letters in the mail that said, hey, you've turned 50 or you're, you're due again for your breast screening or you're due again for colon cancer screening or you're due for your pap smear. So you might have received those letters. And then once you've completed that test, you actually get a letter in the mail that says, what your result was and what you need to do about it. So if you have a positive result, then you need to contact your doctor. And if you've had a negative result, that when you would need to come back for screening. Unfortunately, due to COVID, those letters were paused um, just because of the amount of work that goes into making sure that everybody gets those letters. And they've been paused since last March, but hopefully the next couple of months, if all goes well, that those letters will resume again. So if you've noticed that you haven't gotten those letters, um, that that's actually true, that you probably haven't received them in in a, in a while. But that's not to say that the programs are closed and I'll go through each one of them as we as we go through them. So the first program I'm going to talk about is the colon cancer check program. And this is for colorectal cancer screening. That is what the sample bottle looks like. And I actually brought one with me tonight. This is what it looks like. Um, and so that is for average risk individuals. And so that's for individuals who are aged 50 to 74. So all men and women aged 50 to 74 are invited to, to um, participate in a fecal immunochemical test. And so what we mean by average risk is that it's an individual who does not have a first degree relative of colon or rectal cancer or hasn't previously been found to have a high risk um, colon uh, abnormality. Also two people with inflammatory bowel disease uh, or known genetic syndrome, such as the Lynch syndrome that was uh, spoken about earlier are also reasons that you would not be considered at average risk. And so basically what you do, it's one test. You do your, your business, you poke your stools with this applicator, you put it back in and you pop it in the mail. It's as easy as, as that. What you need to do if you want to get one of these tests and you're, you're due for screening and you get the letter in the mail that says that you're due for screening is to contact your family doctor who will then fax a requisition to the lab and the lab will mail the test kit to your home and then you just have to pop it back in the mail to uh, to complete it, to to get your test results back and you have to do that within six months. Um, if we're at increased risk, we, what is recommended is that you have a colonoscopy. And what's considered increased risk, as I mentioned earlier, is that you have a first degree relative with colon or rectal cancer, or you have some, you're on some other program because of some of the high other things that may have put you at high risk. And so basically what we recommend is that you have a colonoscopy starting at age 50 or 10 years younger than the earliest age of diagnosis of the relative or whatever comes first. So if your relative was your father was diagnosed with colon cancer at 55, you would start screening it with colonoscopy at 45 years of age. Uh, if, you're, if your father or mother had colon cancer at age 75 or 80, then you would start colonoscopies at age 50. So a couple of things I wanted to point out about colon cancer screening is, it says you're age 50 to 74. And that is for everybody who is man or, male or female, who is at average risk between the ages of 50 and 74 is invited to participate. After the age of 74, so starting from 75 to 85, if you're still in pretty good health, you may still want to continue to do the test. So they will still do the test up until the age of 85. Um, if you're in good health, to, and, and obviously you don't have any symptoms or anything like that. So something you may want to also talk to your doctor about in terms of ordering a test if you're between that 75 and 85 and are in pretty good health. The other point I wanted to make about colon cancer screening is that um, a lot of people have had colonoscopies and they've had several colonoscopies and they have no family history and they've actually had normal colonoscopies. Well, you know, at some point in time, you can actually switch over to having one of the fecal immunical chemical tests. Because if you've had colonoscopies in the past and they've been normal and you're at average risk, you're actually at much lower uh, risk of developing cancer than the general population. So this is something you may want to consider. And this is something that may actually be almost forced upon you um, 
if, if you're due for screening, because we have such a huge backlog of people who actually need to get their colonoscopies as a result of COVID. So something to keep in mind that if you were supposed to have a colonoscopy because it was, it's been five years since your last one and you had a small uh, benign lesion, that you may want to consider having a fit instead if you are due for screening because you actually may not get your colonoscopy for a few years down the road uh, once we clear up some of the backlog. Next program I'm going to talk about is the Ontario Breast Screening Program. And what's considered average risk for breast cancer is most women between the ages of 50 and 74. And you might have noticed that we've now, we're now saying not all women, but most women. So most all women will be invited to participate in screening for breast cancer via mammogram. And that's women between the ages of 50 and 74 will be invited. But for some women between the ages of 50 and 74, they may feel that because of their own personal preferences, preferences and their values, that they may not want to have a mammogram for whatever reason. They may be worried about it causing too much anxiety. They may be worried about the false positives. And so that's why we now say most women, and we, it really depends on your conversation with your doctor as to whether or not you would prefer to have a mammogram or not. For those women age 40 to 50, because I know it's going to come up, uh, but what's, what the recommendation is for that is that, again, you have a conversation with your doctor because it may not be appropriate for all women between the ages of 40 and 50 to have a mammogram, but for some women, they may want to consider um, having one if that's what their preference is and what they, what they value. Similarly, for women over the age of 75, so 75 and on, if they feel like they're in pretty good health and they feel that they still want to undergo mammogram screening, it is something, again, that you won't automatically be called back to do, but you may want to consider doing if you're in pretty good health and you feel like you want to continue screening. And your, daughter, your doctor would have to order that test for you. The recommended interval for mammograms in Ontario is every two years, but the Canadian recommendations are actually every two to three years and some other jurisdictions around the world are two to three years as well. For COVID, um, because it's going to be a lot harder to get mammograms um, just because of, of um, what's going on in terms of the numbers and what have you, if you wait to have your mammogram until the three year within that two to three year mark, it would be appropriate to do so. Um, but once you've passed that three years, you may want to consider if it's been more than three years, you may want to consider being screened. What we've done for COVID, during COVID is that some jurisdictions, and so in the Toronto area, what's been happening is some of the clinics, in order to catch up from the backlog from not having done mammograms in 2020 because of COVID, is that some of the mammogram sites, the OBSP sites, have actually increased their hours. So they have, they're offering now more evening hours and they're offering some weekend hours in order to catch up on some of that backlog. Now I'm going to move into women who are at high risk, and these are people that are known to have a high risk gene, so some of the stuff that was spoken about earlier, um, or they've had radiation to the chest, and usually that radiation to the chest was uh, below the ages of 30. And, and oftentimes that's usually for, um, in more recent years, due to uh, usually a type of lymphoma that it often involves radiation that oft sometimes will cover the, the breast as well in terms of the field of radiation. The women who uh, are invited to participate, if they are considered at high risk, are women age 30 to 69, and they actually get a mammogram and an MRI every year. For some women, an MRI may not be appropriate for whatever reason, and in that case, it may be appropriate to have a breast ultrasound. So I'm going to move on to cervical cancer screening, um, and this is all women between the ages of 25 and 69 are going to be are invited to participate. Some of you may think that's a little bit older than when they started, and that's because the, the Ontario just recently uh, changed their guidelines from 21 to 25 years of age in terms of initiating cervical cancer screening. So that's the pap smear currently. That's the, the test that we're using right now. And that um, and this includes women who um, have been vaccinated against the HPV vaccine. There's a lot of people who think, oh, I had the vaccine, so I'm pretty protected. Um, so I don't have to uh, get a pap smear. And that's not true. You still have to get pap smears. Women who have not engaged in sexual activity for a long time. So I have a lot of patients who come in and say, oh, Dr. Del Judice, I haven't had 
any activity down there in at least 20 years. So I really don't need that pap smear. And they actually really do need that pap smear. Um, so that's not an excuse to get out of doing one. You still need to have one. Women who have sex with women still have to have pap smears. And obviously trans males with a cervix also have to have a pap smear. But if you've had never, ever, 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 ever had any sexual activity ever, then you would you would be excluded from being eligible for a pap smear. Pap tests are done every three years and you can stop at the age of 70, providing that you've had three normal pap smears in the last 10 years. So I have some patients who come in and they're 73 years old and they say, you know what? I'm done with pap smears. I have passed the age of 70 and I don't need to have one, but they haven't had a pap smear in 10 years and they actually still need to have one. Um, so just want to put that out there that even though you've passed the age of 70, if you haven't had three normals before the age of 70, you still have to have that uh, normal test to, to be able to stop. And finally, I'm going to introduce our new, new kid on the block, the Lung Cancer Screening Program, which just was initiated uh, at the beginning of this month in April. So it's hot off the press. And these are, this program is open to current and former smokers who are aged 55 to 74. They've had to smoke cigarettes daily for at least 20 years. And it doesn't have to be 20 years in a row. So you could smoke for five, then off for two, then smoke for 10, then off for three. Um, and you would still qualify. You have to be referred by your family doctor, but we know that some people don't have family doctors, but you can also self-present to an Ontario Lung Screening uh, Program site. So that is the possibility, but it's better to go through your family doctor and be referred that way. And I just wanna let you know that not everybody who has smoked um, cigarettes for 20 years um, between the ages of 55 and 74 will be eligible for the program. What you do is you, you have a phone discussion with a navigator who does a thorough risk assessment. And if you're still considered to be at risk based on your history and age criteria, then you would go on to be screened and not everybody ends up being screened. And basically what that test is, is a low, desk cat, a low dose CAT scan that's done every year for three years. And then I just wanted to talk a little bit about a couple of other cancer related screening tests. So in recent years, it was recommended by the Canadian Task Force in Preventative Healthcare that everyone born between, the, between 1945 and 1975 should get a one-time hepatitis C uh, blood test. And that, the reason why we want to do this, we want to identify people who've had hepatitis C and you're more likely to get it if you were born in this age group for various reasons. And basically what we would do is we would treat the hepatitis C because we know that people who have hepatitis C and have had hepatitis C for a long time are at increased risk of developing what we call liver cancers or hepatocellular carcinomas. So that's something that you may want to have done. And then in terms of prostate cancer screening, I know it's on uh, most men's minds and I know it's, it's, it's everyone talks about it, all the men talk about it in the locker room. It is not currently recommended for all men to have a PSA test. So uh, we don't invite every single male between the age of 50 and 70 for, to get a prostate uh, cancer test, a PSA test, uh, pr prostate specific antigen blood test. And that's because it may not be appropriate for all men because there can be a lot of false positives and there can be a lot of prostate cancers that are diagnosed that won't go on to develop into, into anything serious. And so it really has to be dependent upon um, uh, your own personal values and your own personal preferences. But if, it, if, if you do wanna consider having it done, it might be a discussion you may wanna have if you're a male between the ages of 50 and 70. It's not recommended below the age of 50 if you don't have a family history. So if you do have a family history, you may want to consider, yeah, you should consider screening actually if you do have a family history. And then over the age of 70, we find that there are a lot more po false positives um, than, than you would get that would be the harm that outrisks the benefits of doing the test. And that's all I have. I'll turn it back to you, Calvin. Uh, that's amazing. Uh, again, thank you so much. Dr. Del Gioce, it's, uh, you know, you, you know my part. I work with you all the time. I think I, I, I do the treatment side when there is a cancer, but it's, you just can't, can't ever express the value of what you do in cancer screening. Everything I've learned from all of you tonight, again, that you can 
you don't even need to be there at that treatment if we can get this part right. And there's so many <laughs> things, it's amazing. And it's a wonderful, wonderful reminder for us. Um, you know, as you said, be proactive, take control of your health. And, uh, and I think that's a fantastic message. Uh, you know, over the last year, none of us felt like we had control of much of anything. So it's great to just be reminded that there are a lot of things uh, that we can do. So thank uh, to you, Dr. Dugudite, to Rachel and to Tracy for uh, your wonderful uh, presentations tonight. So for the audience, this concludes our formal presentations for the evening. And we're gonna to get to the question and answer portion of the night. So we're gonna bring our panel back on screen now. And um, we've got some questions um, uh, from people. I, I've got a few, uh, a few to start, uh, start us off. And I think that uh, it really shows the interest and, and, and uh, the, the spark you've, you've really brought out. So Tracy, I'm, I'm gonna start with you. I, again, I totally get this uh, uh, fr from uh, me, uh, 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 not the doctor side, but I have cancer family history on both sides of my uh, parents. And, um, and I think this question is amazing. So you know, a lot of times they, they've gotten everything you've said about learning your pedigree and, and, and matches and looking for the patterns so you can send the right tests. But how does a patient get from that appointment where they're just, you know, getting overloaded with, I've got a cancer? How do they get from there to seeing a genetic counselor like you or, or to get themselves assessed? And, and some of them, uh, some of the questions are, I, I don't even know how I could find out about my own family history. Where's that bridge? How did they find their way to you? That's a really good question. That's a loaded question. There's a lot there. Um, yeah. I mean, we see people at all stages and all phases. Um, being in a cancer center, obviously, I would say half of our patient population are going to be men and women with a cancer diagnosis. And a lot of them are definitely happening right at the time of diagnosis. And it's a lot. So it can be very overwhelming. And it's it's become an interesting piece in the whole puzzle because, you know, a lot of people are going to want to know as much as they can to help them make informed decisions. And genetics is one of those pieces now because it is driving decisions, whether it's different surgical treatments, uh, whether it's different chemo plans, different medical management. So it is an important thing. So we have, I mean, from that standpoint, we have an amazing oncology team that all recognizes those patients that are really key to get referred right away. Um, we obviously have also started doing what we're going to call mainstream genetic testing, which is now educating our oncology colleagues to be the upfront orderers of genetic testing for um, certain cases that uh, don't require a, a complex pedigree analysis because there's certain uh, criteria, a man with breast cancer, a woman with a certain type of ovarian cancer, any pancreatic adenocarcinoma, those are all testable on their own. And so we can streamline and facilitate much quicker testing by starting there. And then genetics kind of comes in after the fact. And so we reach out to them to say, look, we know you've given a blood sample, testing is on, on its way. While we're doing that, let's try to collect some of that family history. Now, the actual way of collecting history when they don't know about it, that's a tough one. I mean, it's, it's a challenge for some people. We have patients that have been adopted don't know their family history. And that's a real tough one. And we've been working recently with the Ministry of Health to revamp some of our testing criteria to make it a little bit more lenient and open to a little bit broader. So, you know, whereas you might have to have a woman diagnosed at a certain age with family history, if she was adopted, we might increase that age a bit to give a little bit more wiggle room to allow for genetic testing on some of those unknown factors. There's a lot of websites out there, Ancestry.com, and a lot of different genealogy websites that patients are tapping into and trying to collect some of those family history details. We ask a lot, but we work with what we can get. That, you know, the bottom line is the more information we get on family history, the better our risk assessment is going to be, the more accurate. But we realize families are coming from different countries, different cultures don't talk about cancer, don't talk about family history, don't re reveal those details to that next generation. And so we do work with that and we do the best we can to provide that risk assessment. And we do help walk them through kind of how to collect that family history detail when they're sort of stuck and can't kind of get it. 
Did I kind of yeah. answer the question? Yeah, absolutely. It was okay. very, very helpful. I think I think you've certainly generated interest now. People are like, I need to learn more <laughs> and make sure I've got it. So that that's yeah. great. Rachel, just as hard one for you. You know, it's the simplest questions that can be a bit broad, but let's see what you can do with this one. So they were fascinated by, you know, just boiling it down to some simple dietary suggestions. But the question was, do different cancer diagnoses warrant having different diets? How are there some general pointers? I know that we can't get into all of the different types. Yeah, what a what a good question. And I think, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, we're talking about someone who has already been diagnosed with cancer, right? Yeah. So for that, really, it's, it's important to understand that the goals of nutrition when you're going through cancer treatment are so much different than general healthy eating guidelines or, or really the things that I just spoke about. So goals of nutrition during cancer treatment are really about making sure your body can tolerate the treatment. Chemotherapy, radiation, surgery, they're all such a huge stress on the body. So the better able you are to nourish your body and, and keep strong, reduce risk of infection, maintain your muscle mass, the better able you are to tolerate the treatments. And that's how nutrition plays a role in um, cancer treatment. So three goals maintaining body weight, getting enough protein, and staying well hydrated. I talk about it with everyone. Um, so those goals don't change from cancer type to cancer type. What does change is the side effects that come along from the various treatments. So that's where we're going to talk about individualized um, um, nutrition therapy. That's where my job comes into play. That's why I get employed here. So different cancers are going to have different side effects from nausea, to vomiting, to constipation, to diarrhea, to bowel obstructions, to not being able to swallow, and, and so on and so forth. Um, all of those side effects are going to have different recommendations, and that's where people really need to see a, a registered dietitian. Um, most cancer centers have one, and, and those are the people that can help you from a nutrition aspect, get enough calories, get enough protein, get enough um, fluids, no matter what challenges you may be facing. That's great. Very good reminders. Uh, I think the principles totally make sense. That was very helpful. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you. So, you know, I one of the things that was nice tonight at the beginning, I said it was nice to talk about things you can't control and 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 things take, you know, your health under your own control. But I knew that we couldn't escape the shadow of COVID-19 for very long. So, Lisa, I, I know this is near and dear to your heart. So this question is for you. But, um, you know, the question was some of my screening appointments have been delayed or canceled because of uh, COVID-19. And how can I continue to manage my health from home until I get screened or what should I uh, be watching for in terms of screening in this difficult time? Yeah, and I think I pointed a couple of things, but I'm happy to reiterate them. So for each of the programs, so in terms of the uh, colorectal cancer screening program, the uh, fit testing is, is a go. It's easy to do. You do it at home. Uh, your doctor can fax that in and it comes in the mail for you. If you're due for a colonoscopy, I think that's hit and miss and it depends where you are. And so when the numbers go up, the endoscopy units uh, shut down as they have recently. And so some people who might've had colonoscopy appointments scheduled because they are at increased risk or um, even for surveillance as well, th those might've been canceled, especially recently and they certainly were canceled last year. If you're at average risk and you usually get a colonoscopy, this may be the time where fit may be more appropriate for you um, because the people who are at, considered at average risk are going to be bumped down the list uh, to accommodate those people who are symptomatic and those people so have symptoms, so rectal bleeding or anemias that we can't figure out why they're where they're from, as well as those people who um, uh, have, have a, a family history and a strong family history. So those are going to get priority. So this may be the time to switch over. As far as breast cancer screening is concerned, 
we've actually seen a lot of cancellations. So a lot of people have canceled their appointment thinking that the hospitals are closed or thinking that people can't come into the hospitals. Um, and that uh, once we've reopened, we have been reopened and then some. So we have more appointments than we normally would have to try and catch up on the backlog. And so um, there's no reason to cancel your appointment. Even if you have one this week, the mammograms are still up and running. We've been assured that that will not shut down, uh, even with the numbers going up and with the reduction in services that the hospital is hospitals and clinics are providing. So please don't cancel those appointments, keep them and certainly schedule them. So that's really, really important. Uh, the high risk screening program continued throughout, I, I especially in the Toronto area, it didn't take a it didn't miss a beat even in 2020. So that was still continuing on. Uh, pap smears are a little bit more difficult. So for what we've been recommending for pap smears, I know family doctors are overwhelmed right now with everything else going on. And a lot of them are pitching in doing various things. For those people who have, an, have had an abnormality in the past, so they've had a high grade uh, abnormality on their pap smear and they've been advised to have annual pap smears, those are continuing. So if you are one of those people who has been told you need to have a pap smear every year because of your previous abnormality, those are continuing to happen. Um, but those who are sort of at that two and a half, three year mark, even a little bit past the three year mark, it really varies upon where you are in Ontario and how busy your family doctor is and whether or not they're doing them or not. Um, so those really vary in terms of what your previous pap smear was like. So if your previous pap smear was abnormal, then you'd have them. The lung cancer screening program in the Toronto area is up and running um, and ready for business. And so that um, that is, if you are someone who you think may be eligible, you may go to your family doctor and ask about it. It's called the Ontario Lung Screening Program if they haven't heard about it. Like I said, it was new and it didn't make a big launch just because the launch happened at the time that COVID was sort of going into wave three. And so it, a, a big launch was inappropriate at that time, but it is still up and running. So some things that can still be done and are being done through the COVID, through COVID and, and currently. That's great, that's great. I know it's been hard for everybody, but I, I like your point. Don't cancel your appointments. They're, what's open is open. So that's, that's fantastic. Um, Tracy, uh, interesting question for you. Another thing uh, that is, part of the wonderful thing about Toronto, which is our, uh, obviously our huge diverse uh, ethnic groups and, and cultures, and those are great. But the question was, um, do you see any differences in how genetic testing should be applied to other immigrant populations, especially those who, you know, they're worried about the fact that they, their families or themselves come from varying environmental situations with different social and environmental factors that might not have been as commonly studied. Um, I know you went through some of that, but maybe just to reassure the audience about how you approach that. Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, it's something we're learning about all the time. Uh, the reality is, you know, in, in our genetics world, the majority of the families that we see are going to be of sort of Caucasian, uh, you know, Western European descents. Um, and that's probably the majority of people that have been tested. And a lot of the data is based on that. We're lucky being in Toronto and being where we are. We do have such a diverse group that we see so many people from different backgrounds. Um, and we've identified genetic mutations in families from so many different ethnic groups all around the world. And it's been a really interesting process um, in helping them through the process of even being able to share that information with those families overseas and that may live in countries where they don't necessarily have the same access to genetic testing, but even screening and you know preventive options. So it is, it's a it's a unique area. We've been sort of building. Um, we have a, a pretty amazing database of, of families here, and we have uh, sort of colleagues around the world that we've been sort of pooling with to try to be able to access this to be able to share information from different groups and different cultures. I think we're learning that certain genetic mutations are going to be common in different ethnic groups. That's just the reality. Ashkenazi Jewish just happens to be a very studied group in North America. But I can go to uh, Iceland, for example. And if you have a family history of breast cancer, you probably have one very specific BRCA2 mutation, because it probably represents the entire island. I mean, that's just how 
a lot of these founder mutations kind of come from. And, and so we're starting to learn uh, a lot of different ones. And we have a lot of uh, families from the Philippines and a lot of uh, East Indian and Pakistani families that we're now identifying different mutations that are probably common to their background. And it's an interesting factor because a, it shows us that these hereditary genes, they're everywhere. They're in every group. They kind of come from all of our ancestors, which, of course, if we treat all the way back in time, eventually we all kind of come from the same groupings uh, across the board anyway. And ultimately, it's just a way of trying to get that information out to them uh, to be able to share. Um, not, if, not every family, like I said, talks about these things. There are definitely sensitivities in different cultures and different backgrounds that we're aware of. And we really do try to help, you know, walk through how best to approach that in each family. Oh, that's great. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. So, Rachel, this is a funny one. It's sort of side related to COVID. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, I, I, so people were saying that they, in this time, they, they didn't the evening but they're starting to look this up uh you know in terms of what they can eat and stuff and they notice that there is a lot of marketing on diets like ketogenic diets or anti-inflammatory diets or some sort of uh, superfood uh, uh, it's um you can really get caught up into it and then really read it and and i know that uh, it's hard to sort of answer but some and i think you've gone through some of this but just to help them what are some strong principles so you don't fall prey to that? Really, that's what the question, that's literally the question was, how do I not fall prey to this? So if you can give us some guiding points on that. Yeah, I mean, what a good question. Superfoods are the bane of my existence, let me tell you. Um, but I think like there are a few things that should set red flags off for you. And, and my first one is, is when they're talking about a superfood or a particular diet, are the claims reasonable, right? We all have common sense. It's very easy to get caught up in, in the hype. Um, but say, for example, if we're talking about a superfood, let's use chia seeds like I talked about in my presentation. Are they just simply saying that chia seeds have lots of vitamins and minerals, they're a good source of fiber, and they've got omega-3s, so they're something you could include in your diet as a healthful part of your diet? Sure, that's a reasonable claim. However, if they're saying chia seeds are a superfood that are going to make you 20 years younger, cure your diabetes, cure your cancer, fix all your life problems, I don't know, celery juice was a big one that was fixing all the problems last year, um, that is unreasonable. No, no compound on the face of the planet has that many good benefits, unfortunately. It would make all of our jobs here a lot simpler if it did. Um, the second thing that should set red flags off, I think, in people's heads is who is promoting the diet or who is promoting the food. So is someone promoting a diet who's just written a book about the diet? Are they trying to sell you a supplement? Are they trying to sell you their book? Again, red flags. It's not always bad, um, but it is something to look at. What are their credentials? What background do they come from? And, and what are they standing to gain from selling you this information? Um, that's where looking to organizations like the American Institute for Cancer Research, who, who don't really get a lot of gain out of, out of the research that they do, they're, they're not really for profit, um, you, you can trust them a little bit more than an individual selling you something. Um, and, and really, it does come back to two diets. What we know, like overall in the literature, is that variety is really important. And with a lot of these more fad diets, they will vilify one macronutrient. So 20 years ago, it was fat. Now everyone loves fat and we hate carbs. Um, and if we cut out a whole food group, we really are missing out on, on the benefits of that food group. So really be wary of, of diets that tell you that you can't eat certain foods um, or that whole food groups are bad and really just bring it back to the basics. So variety is important. important. Um, can we all eat more plant foods? Can we all eat leaner proteins? Can we stay away from, within reason, processed foods? And can we kind of drink mostly water? And, and those are really the diet principles that we should be leaning towards. That's, that's great. I, I love that. 
point there when it tries to exclude one you're through warning sign plus the book that's coming you can buy for now for a limited time only for 24.95 exactly. <laughs> thank you so much for that that's very helpful lisa this this one i'm almost i almost don't want to to, to ask because i feel like i'm in this category but <laughs> but during covid people are they're frankly worried whether they're they've gotten healthier or not i think some people have certainly you know taken to walking or doing more. Uh, others like me who spent most of my day on Zoom, I, I think I've actually decreased. I, I, I now miss walking to the H-Wing, if you know what I mean, at, at, on our campus. And I, I think that the question, if I could word it, is like, you know, nowadays, uh, and then you're perfect for it because both from your role of screening and as one of our family physicians, people are just wondering what kind of things they need to be aware of when they're accumulating risk factors for cancer, they didn't even know it. Um, are there health tips or how can they work with their family doctor um, to promote their health and, and really reduce their risk factors? And it sounds almost like a reflection that I would have had. Um, and I didn't eat that hot dog just before getting on this. Uh, okay, it's okay. <laughs> well, as I mentioned, you know, continue to screen if possible. So we did talk about being still screening throughout it and like, especially now and catching up if you missed your screening last year, that that opportunity to catch up now. And then, you know, everything that Rachel said about if you smoke, stop smoking. If you don't eat enough fruits and vegetables, eat more fruits and vegetables. Everybody kind of knows what they need to do. Um, now, if you, if you belong to a family health team, there are dietitians that you can work with in terms of um, getting advice on how to eat, especially, um, um, adjusting or adapting your diet to the foods that you're familiar with. So we talked about multiculturalism here in, in, in the GTA area and that how do you choose foods that are more common to the ones that you do eat and what, how, which ones to select and what have you. So working with a dietitian would be obviously um, fantastic if you have that opportunity to do so. And as I mentioned, a lot of family health teams have that opportunity uh, to do it. And then exercising, and you don't have to do much. No one says you need to go and buy a $4,000 Peloton bike uh, which, <laughs> and let it collect dust in the basement. Before <laughs> the, I think people just do it because they spend so much money on it. Yeah. Now they feel like, I got to get my money's worth out of it. So if that motivates you, great. But just walk. And that's all you need to do. And we usually recommend start off small even if it's walking to the end of your driveway and back and then every day just increase the amount that you you do so walk to the end of the block and then walk two blocks and back and so just build it up and do something you like to do and if it's just blaring the music and dancing blare the music and dance if that's you know you enjoy doing uh just move really and if it's dancing if it's walking whatever it is you don't have to get fancy um do it. I, I think those are the big, the big things that I think will help you get through this. And it, it is great to clear your mind and get out of the house and get off the Zoom calls and go for a walk. And I agree with you. I mean, walking to work, even if you were commuting to work and you had to walk from the subway to the, you know, to the building that you work at and what have you, I mean, we, we've all lost that. And it's really unfortunate, but good weather is coming. <laughs> and so you can get it back out there and you can just enjoy the fresh air and the good weather on a nice walk. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, Lisa, my uh, two university kids had returned home ages ago when it looked like this pandemic wasn't ending and they were right. And uh, yeah, every time I try to do that little, pull out my old 80s music and do a little dance, I get this, stop immediately. <laughs> well, maybe that'll get to the house now. Maybe <laughs> you doing that and then go back to university. Yeah, that's right. I'm like, why are you still here? What? I thought I got rid of you. Why are you still here? All right. Well, this has been incredibly helpful and, and I think uh, just wonderful. I think the, the, the last question I have, I'm just going to let each of you maybe give one word of wisdom because I think this was a really good question and, and I think we can wrap it up here. But it was uh, a question that I think is near and dear to everyone's heart. Um, and question goes like this, is there a way for me to manage my health from home? I really am not sure that I should be going into the hospital right now, both for 
uh, other people that need to help or for my own concerns. And, and I just thought maybe we'll start in the order of our talk, Tracy, Rachel, and, and Lisa, maybe one hint for resources from your perspective um, that, that patients can um, look at uh, and our people can look at to, to learn a bit more from home. Yeah, it's such a timely good question these days. Um, I mean, I can just speak from my own experience and, and about our genetics team here. Um, quite honestly, since COVID, we've gone entirely virtual. So team genetics has gone from exclusively 100% seeing everybody in person to exclusively 100% seeing everybody remotely now. I miss seeing people in person. However, the reality is, is we've shown and we've proven that we can do it this way and it's been working well. So anyone referred for a genetic consult is seen virtually either through a medical Zoom appointment that we've been running and we do group sessions. So we kind of start with a presentation format and then we go off into individual breakout rooms to provide that one-on-one -on -one genetic counseling. Um, and then those that aren't uh, necessarily appropriate for that or that require additional help like translating service than we do as a one-on-one -on -one phone call. And so for the most part, that's been working very smoothly. Obviously, the one limit factor for us is if genetic testing is being offered, we do need a sample. And so for, for some patients, it's a decision of whether we're doing a blood draw, either at a hospital, or we've been working with our local life labs as well. So patients have the option if they're already going in for other work to do a genetics blood draw at the same time. And then I did touch on this in the presentation, we now have the option of using saliva kits. So we can actually mail out a spit kit and you you basically have to uh, spit for really about 20 minutes into a little tube and then it mixes it up and you literally pop it in the mail and it uh, comes back. So that is really how genetics has gone virtual. So I, I don't see it going anywhere different for a long time for us. That's uh, amazing. Uh, you guys have shifted so fast and I think uh, just in an incredible way. So that should be very encouraging for people to hear that they don't have to come in to access yeah. genetics care. Exactly. Rachel, how about how about uh, your parting uh, words of wisdom for people at home? Yeah, I mean, I think I'm going to echo what Tracy said. Uh, uh, mostly our department also has gone virtual during COVID. So we used to see people face to face, um, but a lot of our counseling can be done over the phone or through Zoom. Um, so I implore people if if they used to see a dietitian or seek nutrition services person to person, um, ask if, if those appointments can be done virtual, because I would say 9.5 out of 10 times they can. Of course, sometimes we're still seeing people in person if we're doing tube feeding stuff or, or, or things like that that require hands-on um, teaching. But otherwise, um, we, can, we can do most of our, our things virtually. Otherwise, if we're really bored at home and we're wanting to do some nutrition reading, um, Google can be your friend or it can be your foe. So look for um, nutrition information from big accredited um, um, societies that, that really look at the whole, whole body of literature. So the American Institute of Cancer Research is a great place. Canadian Cancer Society has great information. Um, Sunnybrook itself, we have some of our own handouts up on the Odette Cancer Center page that we've developed. Um, so really go to those organizations and, and stay away from, from the blogs and, and the latest nutrition info because you can just drive yourself crazy reading that stuff. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> Good advice uh, in this time. Um, Lisa, uh, last but not least, again, we, you know, I think uh, for all of my colleagues who've had their uh, work quite disruptive, I can't, you know, think enough about my family pr practice colleagues who are trying to keep everybody's primary health going okay, and yet, you know, been so disruptive. And I know you've already given a, a lot of amazing hints uh, even uh, reviewing with us My Cancer IQ, which I thought was great, you know, a tool that already exists to help you. But I guess from that primary care point of view, combined with a bit of screening, any final words for people? What can they do at home to maximize their access to health in these times? Yeah, and, and, and we're open as well. We've been open for business the whole time and most family doctors are open for business. I know it's kind of tough. Usually when they used to call, you'd get a live voice. Now, I think most doctor's offices, you have to leave a message, but do leave a message. Mo I would say the majority, over 90% of family doctors are and primary care providers, so GPs, family doctors, nurse practitioners 
are still working, are still taking messages, are still booking appointments. It's just not like we used to in terms of having a live voice at the end, but leave a message. And if you're instructed to leave a message, leave a message. What I wanted to highlight is that we know that a lot of people are presenting late with symptoms. Mm -hmm. And so what I wanted to say is, you know, be vigilant. If you have blood coming from anywhere that doesn't seem right, you're coughing up blood, you're spitting up blood, you're vomiting blood, you've got blood in your stools, you've got blood in your urine, you need to, you need to tell your family doctor about this, that, that, that is something that can't wait uh, for COVID to be over if, if this ever is going to be over, if we can get passing strain. So then you need to call your doctor. If you have a lump or bump somewhere that's new and, and it doesn't seem right, it doesn't please, please consult your doctor. If you have a skin, something on your skin that is bleeding and it's still bleeding and it keeps coming back and bleeding, you know, talk to your doctor about it. If you're waking up in the middle of the night and you've got a headache that's waking you up in the middle of the night, or you've got bone pain that is waking you up out of your sleep, those are things that you need to talk to your doctor about. That doesn't, that, all these things don't necessarily mean that you have cancer, but sometimes it can be signs and symptoms of cancer that may be a bit concerning. So please, please, please call your family doctor, get the test done, get blood work done, whatever it may need, you may need to do, but you know, things that you should, should do. Shortness of breath, and again, that's another thing. If you have stairs in your home and you go up those stairs, You've gone up those stairs millions of times for 40 years and now all of a sudden you're having a lot of difficulty getting up those stairs um, you're huffing and puffing and you have to stop half of that's something you need to talk to your doctor about it's something that can't wait for covid to be over so just some things to look out for um, and get medical attention and don't worry about being a bother during covid because that's not a bother at all um, we don't want these things to go too long and get become too advanced and we, where we can't do anything about them so that would be my final words amazing amazing thank you so much lisa absolutely and thank you for just putting it out there so people don't we don't have to be afraid of these or talk about this talk to your family doctor they're there to help you they want to help you and so thank you so much for that well i I'm just going to wrap up our Q&A now, and I, I want to thank our amazing panelists tonight, uh, Tracy and Rachel and Lisa. Thank you so much for being with us tonight, for sharing all of your wisdom. I want to spend a moment here to thank our audience for the incredible questions that you came up with that really helped dig deeper into tonight's uh, amazing talk. And I hope that it was as fascinating for you as it was for me. Lots of things to learn. Um, lots of things that I hope uh, you can take back for the health of you and your families and your loved ones. Um, I would ask that uh, for all of you, please take a moment to fill out our electronic evaluation form. This is so um, uh, meaningful to us. We want to constantly improve uh, in our planning of future talks, our formats in addressing the needs of our community that we serve. And so it really means a lot to us. A small plug for all of you, um, when your time comes up, please get yourself vaccinated, protect yourself and your families. If you have any questions or doubts about it, even though all your physicians are busy and all your other healthcare providers are busy, please ask us and we'd be delighted to answer any questions in regards to vaccination uh, uh, or when your time comes up for your shot, please, uh, again. Finally, once again, thank you to uh, my amazing um, colleagues tonight for your incredible time and all the information. Um, for the audience, once again, we have upcoming topics. More details are available on our website at www.sunnybrook.ca. I know that the first page is all COVID, but look carefully and you'll see lots of other things that uh, used to have a more prominent uh, face on that page. And, um, and I hope you uh, enjoy these sessions there. We, we do it uh, you know, for all of you. And uh, thank you. And again, have a wonderful evening. Be safe. Take care of yourself. And all the best wishes from all of us to you, our community abroad.